Es ist Zeit, wieder allein zu sein Zeit, die Freiheit zu begleiten Sich zu meißeln in den weichen Stein Es ist Zeit, wieder allein zu sein Was geht ab, YouTube? Vor ungefähr zehn Monaten veröffentlichte ich den ersten Teil der okkulten Elite. Dort redeten viele Opfer von Verstandeskontrolle bzw. rituellen Missbrauch davon, dass die Misshandlungen, denen sie ausgesetzt waren, klar satanistisch motiviert waren. Das äh, beweist die Symbolik und die Sprache, die bei diesen Ritualen benutzt wurde. Zum Glück gab es weit weniger kritische Kommentare, als ich das zunächst vermutet hätte. Und die, die kamen, kamen auch aus einer ganz anderen Richtung, als ich das zunächst vermutet hätte. Dieser Teil der okkulten Elite befasst sich mit der Church of Satan, deren Prinzipien und das, deren Regeln im klaren Widerspruch stehen zu sexuellem Missbrauch und rituellen Misshandlungen und dass deren Prinzipien im Grunde ein Scheiß wert sind. Im letzten Teil der okkulten Elite lernten wir, dass Anton LaVey selbst in seinem Buch Satanic Rituals bekennt, dass die Rituale seiner Religion gnostischen, kabalen, hermetischen und freimaurerischen Einflüssen unterlagen. Und auch der Zweck dieser Rituale, also die zugrunde liegende Ideologie dieser verschiedenen Sekten, teilt sich einen Ursprung und wie wir noch erfahren, einen Überbau. Daher hören wir uns zunächst Dr. Michael Laitman zur Kabbala an, bevor ich euch die Ideologie der Church of Satan näher bringe. Besonders hervorzuheben sind die Einflüsse der Kabbala auf Crowleys Ansichten. Hören wir zur wahren Natur der Kabbala einen weltweit anerkannten Experten, Dr. Michael Laitman. All the systems, other than the wisdom of Kabbalah, are based on suppressing us. That's not true. I was a nun for a year, a Buddhist nun in Tibet. Yes, so you entered some kind of a closed place. Did you do anything with your body? No, meditation. I sat and meditated. In Kabbalah you also have meditation. That's not true. You don't have meditation in Kabbalah? No. Okay, fine. It's totally opposite. It's a completely opposite system. No matter how you put it, all the systems, and the systems of the East in particular, are based on destroying the desire to receive, on destroying the ego. Right. The ego. Kabbalah says that you should increase the ego? Sure. To increase the ego. Yes. The wisdom of Kabbalah is the wisdom of receiving, the wisdom of how to be filled, of how to grasp reality. One has to be cruel and to feel himself as tight-fisted and as a careless spender and as lustful and everything. And he has to go on living with all this and not to suppress anything, but on the contrary, to develop it. Die absichtliche Hinwendung zu den eigenen schlechten Eigenschaften ist das, was auch Crowleys Philosophie auszeichnet. Der Name Telemma bedeutet so viel wie Wille oder Willenskraft. Es geht darum, dem eigenen Willen, völlig ungezügelt und frei von den Moralvorstellungen anderer, genau wie in der Kabbala gelehrt, nachzugehen. Crowleys zentraler Leitsatz ließ sich dementsprechend wie folgt. In gewisser Weise dient Dilemma, ebenso wie die Kabbala, der Rechtfertigung schlechter Taten, eine Art Gewissensberuhigung. Diese Philosophie hat sich auch auf den Neosatanismus übertragen. So sagt zum Beispiel Alexander LeBay, der Begründer der Church of Satan, wenn du ein Sünder sein willst, sei der beste Sünder im Block. Wenn du etwas Ungezogenes tun willst, dann tu es. Sei dir darüber bewusst, dass du ungezogen bist und genieße es. Wir glauben an den Schmerz, wir glauben an den Egoismus, wir glauben an alle wollüstigen Gedanken, die die Menschheit antreiben, denn es sind des Menschen natürliche Gefühle. Satanism is a philosophy that has been formulated and organized into a a productive social force that uh, uh, takes or accepts the premise that man is not a creature to be redeemed, but one who must recognize within himself his own potential, his own liabilities, and deal with them accordingly. We feel as Nietzsche felt when he obviously wrote uh, also struck thoughts. The opinion is that Man can no longer fall back on established religion as a sort of identity, a collective identity. And occultism is a sort of do-it-yourself God kit, in whatever form it takes, oriented towards personal power. I was an animal ecologist who coined the phrase pecking order, which came into widespread use. At the time, 
W.C. was referring to the behavior of hens who would use their beaks as a weapon to establish a chain of command in the chicken coop. The top hen would peck on all the others, but they couldn't peck on her. The next one down would peck on everyone but the top hen. The third one down would peck on everyone but the top two, and this would continue straight down the line until you come to the bottom hen, who was pecked on by everyone and couldn't peck back. Many might argue that human society is structured the same way. You have the masters and the slaves with varying levels of dominance and submission. But W.C. noticed a third option among animals with greater intelligence. Social cooperation. This follows the reasoning of Ayn Rand when she spoke of the ideal man and Friedrich Nietzsche when he spoke of the Ubermensch or Overman. In both cases, the superior human is seen as having no need to dominate or be dominated by others. The superior human leads by example and does not require validation within a menial pecking order. Philosophical Satanism revolves around this concept of recognizing your sovereignty as an individual. Now sometimes we have to look at these things allegorically because an image is more powerful than words alone. When you ask a Christian what the goal of their religion is, they will often tell you that it is to emulate Jesus the Christ, to walk in his footsteps. Satanists sometimes choose a similar mythological figure, that of the archangel Lucifer refusing to accept the authority of a god above himself. Comparatively, the Satanist desires to emulate what the archangel Lucifer is doing, refusing to accept the authority of a god above himself. This is what Crowley meant when he wrote, There is no god but man. Howard Levy, better known as Anton LaVey from San Francisco, was encouraged to create a Church of Satan by professional publicist Ed Weber. Anton was told that the press was going to flip out over all this and that he would get a lot of notoriety. The gimmick worked and LeVay became a popular cultural icon. Tragically, this new religion does misrepresent the philosophy proposed by Crowley and Nietzsche, and tries to dogmatize individualism with satanic rules and statements. Some of my work was eventually recognized by Anton LeVay, who was the high priest of the organization known as the Church of Satan at that time. He has since died. But uh, he asked me to uh, take part in the Church of Satan and become a priest within its membership. And uh, I accepted that offer, and I became a priest in the Church of Satan. And what my job was to do was basically, for the most part, um, explain the ideology of Satanism to people in, in an attempt to take more people into the ranks of that ideology. Ob Mark Passio das ist, was er behauptet zu sein, lässt sich schwer mit Bestimmtheit sagen. Allerdings deckt sich das, was er über die Philosophie der Church of Satan sagt, sehr mit dem, was LeVay und einige seiner Anhänger bzw. Familienmitglieder über die Church of Satan sagen. Dieser Sonnenschein hier ist Nicholas Schreck. Ein ehemals prominenter schwarzer Magier, der gemeinsam mit seiner Frau Sina Schreck, der Tochter von Anton LeVay, die Magieschule Werewolf Order leitete. Er war nie Mitglied der Church of Satan, aber er stand Anton LeVay sehr nah. Außerdem produzierte er die Dokumentation Charles Manson Superstar und war Meister des Temple of Seed. Der Temple of Seed ist eine Abspaltung der Church of Satan von Anton LaVey auf der Grundlage des Buches Book of Coming Forth by Night, das Dr. Michael Aquino persönlich von Satan diktiert bekommen haben will. Zu Colonel Aquino kommen wir dann nochmal etwas später.
Uh, and, you know, most people don't really understand what the ideology of Satanism is. They think it's about devil worship. It has nothing to do with the worship of the Christian notion of the devil. Uh, this is, uh, Satanism basically has four main tenets or overarching principles of belief. And that is that self-preservation is the highest goal. And um, you should do whatever you can to advance your, your personal power and influence in the world, no matter who you really have to walk all over, step on, or hurt to get what you want. That's really the number one tenet. And if you look at society, most of society is stuck in that cutthroat, dog-eat-dog mentality. There are limitations imposed by your own self-discipline and fortitude, not because you believe what you read from God. That's a very primitive and silly way to go about living. We live because we know what is right for us. You know. Mm -hmm. And to us, you, as it says in this... You've constructed your own individual reality. And I think it works a hell of a lot better than the Christian one. Uh, moral relativism is the second major tenet, which is the idea that there's really no such thing as uh, objective standards of right and wrong behavior that we as human beings can get to basically decide upon our whims what right and wrong are and, uh, you know, base our actions accordingly. And if you look at most of society, I would say more people than not are moral relativists than moral objectivists who think that there is an objective standard of right and wrong behavior. So that's also very pervasive in society. What if you're wrong? What if you're that wrong? What is wrong is and wrong? right? And in our case, we, we are making up our reality. We decide what's right and wrong. What you are wrong? letting the Bible or Jesus Christ or whatever God may be even Decide. common sense. I mean, even leaving God out of it to suggest that you can make up your own reality. My goodness, that's what they did in Tiananmen Square. Uh, that's what they did in Germany in 1933. Hitler was a masterful black magician. Of course, he created a reality. Was it evil? I'm telling you that I don't believe in good and evil, and nor can any can anyone decide what is good and evil. It's all based on historical and cultural values. The third major tenet is social Darwinism, the idea that the most ruthless in society have some sort of a predetermined or predestined right to basically rule over everybody else in society because their genetics got them there and, you know, made them fit for rulership. And, you know, many people will actually think like that and think that that's okay, that that's just the natural order or the way things are. We have no regard for the masses. Satanism is a religion for the elite. It is a religion for leaders. It's a religion for competent people. It's not a religion for anyone who wants to be a Satanist. We don't say welcome the to the homeless, club. the handicapped, those with I don't multiple care. sclerosis. I don't, don't not want apply. the homeless, the handicapped. The people That's your in Mother job. Teresa's home you've for take, the dying and the take, destitute, they need not apply. I don't want them. You've taken that on your shoulders. That's your job. You're doing a great job with the homeless. You help everyone. We're helping those who help themselves, as it says in your Bible. And you can take the weak. No, it doesn't you, say that in the Bible. You can take the decrepit. You can take people who can't help themselves. We don't want them. It's simple. It's very All simple. Is if you the homeless, you don't want to shelter? No, I don't want to shelter people who can't take care of themselves. Why you can't they? The hungry, the starving, you, you don't want to more. feed? Dean, what? Go ahead, Dean. What were you saying? That produces more of the same. There has to be some change. If you look at the animal kingdom, how is the animal kingdom able to survive? There, there is no, no such thing as homeless. Back to social Darwinism again. In the animal kingdom, you preserve what is strong. Well, hang on. You give more food to the stronger animal. Until humans you don't feed the and weaker start killing one. The I, I, I'm Finally, the fourth main pillar of, of Satanism is eugenics. The idea that those who are socially fit to rule and they're the, the fittest in society and therefore they've come out on top and they're ruling the roost, well, they can get to decide who basically propagates their genes and who does not, or in other words, who gets to live and who, who dies, who must die. A murderer who would have us believe that he is the incarnation of the devil. Here's Charles Manson. Okay, I, mill, I, I kill everybody since day one. I murdered them all. I'm God and I've killed everybody. Oh, the devil. Oh, the devil. Yeah, you could use the word devil or demons or whatever you want to call it. Mostly the devil in your world. Eh? Well, okay, I'll play. I'll play. There's no, there's no game I can't play. There's you no game you, I haven't played. You are the devil. Yeah. Okay, I'll be the devil then. Along with Hitler. Cult leader Charles Manson is today's top satanic celebrity. Yeah, I, uh, I, I chopped up nine hogs, 
and I'm going to chop up some more of you. I'm going to kill you as many as I can. I'm going to pile you up to the sky. Responsible for at least nine ritual murders, Manson is revered by many modern-day devil worshippers who have adopted his philosophy of the mass extermination of those they consider unfit to live. We would like to see most of the human race killed off because it is unworthy. It is unworthy of the gift of life. Nicholas Schreck visited Charlie at San Quentin, keeps a picture of his hero on his apartment wall, and displays a lock of Manson's hair as if it were a sacred relic. A bloodbath would be a cleansing and a purification of a planet that has been dirtied and degraded for too long. Satanism is not, like Christianity, a way of gathering sheep together in one place. We feel that the best way to change the world into a satanic arena is by having strong individuals in different areas do their own individual work. So by joining the Church of Satan, you enter into the possibility of going into the higher echelons of the Church of Satan. The Church of Satan is an idea more than a building. It is a large network of people internationally who are committed to the ideas of Satanism. There's only a limited amount of people in the world who can truly say they respond to the Satanic philosophy or understand it. It isn't for the millions. It isn't for the masses. It is for the rulers and leaders of the earth. It's for people who achieve. That's one percent of humanity can achieve. Marilyn Monroe, what was the connection with Marilyn Monroe? That was an affair that the two of them had when they were both very young and were relatively unknown. It just so happened that both of their lives took a, off in a direction that, you know, garnered some fame. But mm -hmm. um, at the time that they had this affair, they were both very young, late teens, early 20s. Sammy Davis Jr. He's been pictured uh, right. worshiping at one of your father's altars, wearing a pentagram. Mm -hmm. Was he at a time a follower of the church? At a time, yes. Who was also inducted as a Knight of Malta within the Roman Catholic hierarchy, interestingly enough. Da sehen wir das York Ride und das Scottish Ride. Wenn man hier bei dem York die Treppe hochsteigt, haben wir den Orden des Roten Kreuzes, den Orden der Malta Ritter und den Orden der Tempelritter. Das sind alles katholische Stufen, die zum 33. Grad durchlaufen werden müssen. Before he became the world famous shock rocker, Marilyn Manson took a little detour into religion. In 1994, the virtually unknown Marilyn Manson was on tour as the opening act for Nine Inch Nails. According to Manson's autobiography, on one stop in San Francisco, he was invited to the home of Anton LaVey, the world-famous Satanist, for a private meeting. Manson arrived at the LaVey homestead alone at 2 a.m. as requested. He was brought into the house by a spooky assistant and led to a meeting room where he claims LaVey simply appeared. The two spoke at great lengths about such stars as Jane Mansfield and Sammy Davis Jr., who LaVey claimed were followers of his. Anton LaVey was so impressed with Manson that he officially certified him as a minister in the Church of Satan. All stars now. Then there's pianist and singer Liberace, heavy metal rock icon King Diamond, and serial killer Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker. In the case of Jane Mansfield, uh, she was an active member of the Church of Satan and certainly under tragic circumstances left the Church of Satan. Perhaps one of those relationships is the one Jane had with hotshot Beverly Hills attorney Sam Brody, who also died in the car accident on Highway 90. Carla LeVay doesn't blame the crash on reckless driving. She says Brody had been cursed by her father, famed in Hollywood as the leader of the Church of Satan. Things had just become worse and worse with Sam Brody. And at one point, he'd come into my father's ritual chamber, and he touched various things that he had no business touching. And, and so after this had gone on for quite some time, my father said, well, this is it. You have a curse on you, and you're going to be dead within a year. So it was not a curse on Jane Mansfield. It was a curse on Sam Brody. And it was just very unfortunate that Jane Mansfield happened to be there at that time. While the late Jane Mansfield 
was for a time among LaVey's most passionate followers. Most of the people that are in my group are professional people. They're business people. They're people that are from very responsible walks of life. Contrary to popular belief, LaVey and Satanists do not sacrifice animals or humans. They actually abhor the practice of harming innocents. In fact, the church has official rules in regards to the practices they do and do not condone called the 11 Satanic Rules for the Earth. Two of those rules, specifically the 9th and 10th, read as follows. Do not harm little children and do not kill non-human animals unless you are attacked or for food. The Church of Satan would have nothing to do with, <laughs> with something like breeders or abductions of children or stealing of animals or that sort of thing because, uh, again, the question why certainly isn't very satanic to want to take anything against its will. Wie wir bereits vorhin hörten, wurde die Church of Satan von verschiedenen vorangegangenen satanistischen Sekten beeinflusst. Am wenigsten ist wohl der Einfluss von Alistair Crowley auf den modernen Satanismus der Church of Satan zu leugnen. Schauen wir uns daher mal an, was Alistair Crowley zum Thema Menschenopfer zu sagen hatte. Hier wurden sexuell religiöse Orgien mit Tieropfern gefeiert. Es soll auch zu Menschenopfern gekommen sein. Mussolini wies ihn 1923 aus. Er hinterließ diverse Schriften, in denen er sich besonders mit Blutopfern beschäftigte. Blut bedeutet Leben und damit Energie. Für die höchste spirituelle Arbeit muss man dementsprechend das Opfer wählen, das die größte und reinste Kraft in sich birgt. Ein männliches Kind von vollkommener Unschuld und hoher Intelligenz ist das befriedigendste und geeignetste Opfer. To the detractors or the accusers or the people of the other side that would say that Satanists would like to kill animals, sacrifice animals, I would say that they would make ideal human sacrifices. I love animals. I have always been part of animals. Animals are part of me. Auf Seite 101 von seinem Buch Satan Speaks uh, schreibt LaVey folgendes. I'm one hell of a liar. Most of my adult life I've been accused of being a charlatan, a phony, an impostor. I guess that makes me about as close to what the devil's supposed to be as anyone. It's true. I lie continuously. Because I lie so often, I'd really be full of shit if I didn't keep my mouth shut and my bowls open. The legend was Anton Sanso Levey had a deeply affectionate relationship with Togari, his pet lion. The reality was as follows. While Anton Sansa LaVey was always careful to portray himself to the public as an animal lover, in private he was cruel and neglectful to his pets. When he was given Togari as a cup in 1964, he was ill-equipped to deal with such an exotic wild animal. Despite his pretensions as a circus lion tamer, as Togari became larger and more unruly, Anton Sanzo LaVey frequently used an electric kettle prod to hurt and frighten him into submission. Many animal rights proponents, including Togori's final owner Tippi Hedren, agree that it is determinal to a wild animal's development to be raised in a domestic environment. LaVey was arrested due to Togori's unruly behavior and LaVey was ordered to donate him to the San Francisco Zoo. After complying, LaVey made only two visits to Togori. Due to the trauma of his early life, Togori needed special care at the zoo and at every animal care facility in which he subsequently lived. Anton Sensor LaVey Er war ein notorischer Lügner und Meister darin, sich selbst zu inszenieren. Das schreibt er, wie gesagt, in seinem Buch und äh, dafür gibt es zahlreiche Beispiele aus seiner Biografie. Dieser Mensch schrieb Bücher über Satanismus. Einige davon enthielten Richtlinien, an die sich angeblich jeder Satanist halten sollte. Und naja, weil eben dieser notorische Lügner diese Behauptungen aufstellte, heißt es, dass 
Tausende von Opfern, deren Therapeuten und Strafverfolger lügen oder paranoid sind? Beschäftigen wir uns etwas mit der Church of Satan. David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, was also a Satanist. The serial killer who terrorized New York while murdering five young women and seriously wounding at least six others. Berkowitz was deeply involved in bizarre rituals. So was Henry Lee Lucas, who told police he murdered his girlfriend, his mother, and others across the country, all for a satanic cult. Why do they want to kill people? He's supposed to be for the reincarnation of the devil. And when a series of ritualistic rapes and murders hit Southern California, it should have come as no surprise that Richard Ramirez, the alleged Night Stalker, worshipped the devil. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Hail a belief system that exalts sadistic murder, torture, ritualistic suicide, and racial purity. This has historically been a sacred day. A day of purification. A day of hell and fury. We mourn not its victims, we honor its victors. In closing, I would remind those here that murder is the predator's prerogative, and there is no murder without blood. Berkowitz, Lucas, Ramirez, and Manson are the all-stars in the halls of infamy. But the vast majority of these ritual murders are not the work of the celebrated psychopath. There are literally hundreds of cases most of us have never heard of. Like this satanic murder in Denver, Colorado, where the victim was handcuffed, chained, and slaughtered. Authorities claim that before he died, the victim participated in drinking his own blood. These ritualistic crimes are everywhere, and yet in most communities they are either overlooked or underreported. There's an example going on right now here in Kansas City that tells us why. In this house, in a quiet residential neighborhood, a series of brutally violent, horrible crimes have been committed. And yet the police and prosecutor in this town seem either unable or unwilling to draw the obvious connection between what happened here and Satanism. All I know is uh, the whole thing was evil. This 22-year-old, call him Jay, escaped from the House of Horrors wearing only a dog collar. For four days, he had been ritualistically tortured by a man named Bob Berdella. He uh, took the a transformer and hooked it to my genitals and stepped back and took pictures while I'm flopping around. What a sick dog. It seemed to never end, you know. After Jay escaped through a window by burning the ropes that bound him to the bed, the police arrested Berdella. When they searched his home, they found over 250 photographs of young men, including Jay, in the process of being tortured, in some cases fatally. Hidden in the walls of the home, they also found a human skull. He had pictures of guys that he had did did things to kids tied up and with marks on them and things apparently Berdella would pick up young men usually hustlers like Joe many of them runaways who cluster in Kansas City strip I need $25 you man. For a small amount of money, these kids go anywhere to do anything with anyone. Unfortunately, some went home with Berdella, whose involvement with devil worship was easily apparent. There was, for example, a satanic symbol on the outside wall of his house. His business card seemed straight from hell, and he ran this macabre shop of horrors, possibly stocking it with his own unique hobby. By agreement with the district attorney, Berdella was allowed to flee to one count of murder. He received a life sentence. But many people in this community are outraged that the investigation went no further. Did you pursue, did the police pursue, these allegations of satanic involvement? The police department, uh, it's my understanding, called in some people who knew about witchcraft to talk to them about that. That particular aspect of the case basically went nowhere. County legislator Carol Cole disagrees. Why do you think there is no attention being paid to that ritual aspect of this case? You're in the heart of America, the Bible Belt, and we hate to think that people like that live next door to us. We're turning our backs on acting like it doesn't happen. We're putting our hands over our eyes as if it didn't occur here, that it was just a murder. This is Detective Lee Orr of the neighboring Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. Do you believe there is a satanic aspect to these horrible crimes? Yes, I'm sure there is, yes. Uh, we've also had contact 
with people that have come out of the occult, Satan worship, who have definitely made statements and uh, who I've interviewed uh, that state that uh, Mr. Rodella was involved uh, at a higher level than most in the occult. If these allegations exist, as we merit to you that they do, isn't it reasonable that if you pursued them with vigor, you might find evidence that could pin more of these crimes on this man that might help solve some of the cases of missing children and missing young adults that you have in this and surrounding communities? There isn't any question that if there are people who have information about him being involved in witchcraft or Satanism, and that information has not been given to us, that we would love to have it because it would be further leads that we could follow. Here perhaps are some leads for investigators to follow. Item. Police reports obtained by us show local authorities have long been aware that devil worshippers were conducting large-scale ceremonies in the Kansas City area. Item. This young man says he was an eyewitness to a sexual orgy at Burdella's house, one with heavy satanic overtones. And item. This woman claims she met Burdella through her former husband, a high priest in a local satanic cult. We were at a meeting in the area, and he was up on the platform in a throne, which symbolizes that that sacrifice at that particular meeting was for him, was done for him. So he was in an exalted position. He was a VIP. Yes, he was. What happened there at that ceremony? There was a young man killed, a young boy. He was 16 years old. Did you ever tell the police about any of this? No, I didn't. Why? People don't believe you when you talk about these things. People just do not believe these things happen. Remember, aside from the torture and sodomy of Jay who escaped, Burdella has pled guilty to just one murder a runaway whose skull was found inside his house. A second murder charge is pending. Yet police sources tell us Burdella is suspected in at least seven homicides. When they excavated his backyard, they found remains of three people. This is Detective Sergeant Lee Orr from the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. You saw him in the video piece. This is retired Detective Michael McKee of the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Gentlemen, the Kansas City Star is reporting as late as yesterday that the district attorney in your community is still insisting that the Burdella case of serial murders or alleged serial murders is not related to Satanism, is not a ritual crime. You were one of the first cops on the scene. Do you believe that this case is satanic, satanically related? It's my opinion that it is. We recovered a ceremonial robe from the bedroom when we excavated the backyard and dug up the skull in the backyard it was buried with a jar of feathers and had some burnt wood with it we also recovered numerous books on the occult from the residence of mr burdell now whether these cases are not being treated as ritual crimes because of embarrassment to the community or because it's easier for cops just to prosecute them as as simple homicides we don't know. No region in this country is beyond the reach of the devil worshippers. Even here in the heartland of America, stories of ritual abuse crop up. The children you're about to meet were born into it. They say their parents forced them to witness bloody rituals, and even they say to participate in ritual murder. Now in the safe haven of a concerned foster family, the children are haunted by their personal nightmares. My dad was involved in a lot of it. Okay, he's like one of the main guys. He's a leader or something. He made us have sex with him and with other guys, and he's done it with other people. Um, I don't know. I just don't like him. Tell us what else besides having sex with him and the other guys he made you do. Kill kids and be there and involved in everything else that happened. And I had to be there. And if I didn't, he threatened you like you're going to be killed or people aren't going to believe you if you tell anybody um, or I'll find you, you know. So he said there's no way out and you must do it. We found out she had been defecated on, that it was smeared all over her body and put in her mouth. My children have talked about all of those things and worse. They've talked about having to kill other children. Well, she told me about the time um, from as as we think was about a year and a half, year and a half, two years old, 
when um, this was the satanic cult that she was involved with. And um, she was made to take a gun and put it up to someone's head. It was another child and pull the trigger. One of the greatest difficulties in reporting a story like this one is that so much of it sounds so outrageous, too dreadful, too bizarre to be true. Well, here in Nebraska and elsewhere across this nation, concerned citizens have gotten together to defeat that disbelief. This organization is called Believe the Children. Its guiding principle, that the stories these young victims are telling are too widespread, too consistent not to be true. The stories are so outrageous, and to this day I'll get in the middle of a story and I'll think, they're going to think I'm crazy. This sounds crazy. But when you begin to hear this same thing time and again, different stories but the same, the same horrible underlying things, the same behaviors in the kids. I'm a stranger. I come up to you and you tell me this story and I say, I don't believe you. How do you react? What do you do? I just say, well, that's your right not to believe it. But someday, if you see something or you hear something from somebody else, just remember what you heard from me. If we were lying, I don't think we would come up with such good lies. Are you telling us the truth? If this isn't true, I mean, you can do anything you want with me, but it's true. So sad. Let's go now to the McMartin preschool parents who have gathered for us in Los Angeles. You recall that case, notorious case. I must state for the record, however, that the charges against most of the defendants have been dropped. Charges are still pending against two of them, however. We know that the parents and the children allege child abuse. What is much less known is that they say it was ritual abuse as part of a satanic cult. Whoever is the designated spokesman there, please tell us why you believe this was part of a ritual cult, uh, abuse as part of a satanic cult. Well, the easiest reason to that question, Geraldo, is the fact when the children started talking, they started talking about robes and candles. They described an Episcopal church. And once they started narrowing that down, you could see that it had to be satanic. It's very important in satanic religions to have a priest because they truly do believe in power. The difference only between Catholicism and the Episcopal religion uh, is almost done. They both use wine, they both use bread, and so on. The truth about Satanism is they truly do use blood, and they mix it with urine, and then they also use the real meat, the real flesh. This is what makes Satanism true, and this is what 1,200 molested kids in the city of Manhattan Beach have told the Sheriff's Department, and it's an outrage that we are where we are with this case, and these poor, unprotected kids that have, uh, that's a third of the school system in the city of Manhattan Beach has been molested. We have eight preschools closed here. You may have heard of uh, a case here in New York recently, where last year actually a, a little six-year-old girl called Lisa Steinberg was murdered allegedly by her own step-parents. Well, that trial for the murder of that little girl opened here in New York today. There were some shocking developments. The defense attorney stated that in some way the parents, or at least one of them, was a member of a satanic cult. That just today here in New York. We're joined now by Maury Terry, author of The Ultimate Evil. He has been studying this and other satanic cases. Why do you believe the satanic cult had something to do with this case of Lisa Steinberg? Well, in the first case, uh, instance, Geraldo, uh, the police removed demonology books from the Steinberg and Nussbaum apartment in New York. In the second place, I have seen writings done by Hedda Nussbaum, the mother of Lisa, if you will, in which she admitted that she was involved with a cult on Long Island that practiced rituals and conducted uh, pornography, uh, pornography and were involved in, in child pornography. What's this, this here is uh, Hedda's diary. This is her own diary? This is Hedda's uh, appointment book diary from 1983. You can expect and, to be subpoenaed after this, right? Yes. And in it you can see here that Hedda was calling deprogrammers, cult deprogrammers, back in the fall of 1983 in order to try to get herself out of this group in Long Island that she had gotten involved with. You have a sketch drawn by Lisa? Uh, we found in the Steinberg apartment a sketch drawn by Lisa in her own hand. Her Look own at it, ladies book. That's drawn by Lisa Steinberg with the satanic pentagram on it and with the descending crescent moon above it. Uh, this, I was told, confirmed by a principal involved in the case that this was the costume that Lisa wore at the rituals on Long Island and that the costume scared her. The prosecution is trying to present this case as a simple homicide. What I'm saying to you here now is that there is a lot more evidence in this case. The case goes much deeper than is being portrayed as going, and this evidence that we're revealing here tonight should certainly graphically uh, illustrate that fact. 
as sickening and unbelievable as it sounds, bearing children for use in satanic rituals may really be happening. My daughter, who I named Wendy, was sacrificed at birth with an upside-down cross and then taken outside and buried. Um, my son, they kept and let live till two years old, and then he was sacrificed. Michael and I had a son, and he was dedicated to Satan at birth. And at six months of age, he was sacrificed to Satan. It is most common for the heart to be taken from the child and offered to Satan. These women say they speak from personal experience. They claim to be breeders, forced by covens to bear children, both as a way for the cults to get new members and to find fresh victims for ritual murder. Did you give birth to infants who were sacrificed? To My first two. Were sacrificed? Were sacrificed. I was told it was the highest honor I could mm -hmm. ever do as a woman, was to sacrifice my first two. And you did that? I was so brainwashed, I believed th their philosophy. Jackie tells us she was able to escape her satanic cult. Today, she helps other women, like Donna, who are trying to break free. You killed your babies? Um... Take the skin off. You skin the baby? You take the baby's skin off? Do you feel remorse? Have you told the police? I had to do what I had to do, or I'd be killed like like the babies that that they that they made me watch killed and that they put in my hand. They said, Obey or this is you. Jackie, you have some pictures drawn during the therapy sessions by the people who've been through this. Why don't you show me some of them? This picture is a person remembering skinning uh, children and babies and hanging it out to dry. And children, skinning? Skinning them, taking the skin off alive while, the, while they are alive and uh, skin them until they die. For their part, mainstream Satanists strongly deny these gruesome allegations. And that's a popular misconception, too, is that children are sacrificed at the altar, that uh, animals are used to, for uh, sacrifices. And it's a horrible, horrible misconception. This is real hard for the police because they can never find proof, and that's because the bodies are sometimes consumed for communion, um, sometimes burnt, sometimes put in concrete. For proof, the women offered a few grisly photos. But as the Satanists are quick to point out, the images of death and decay are impossible to verify. These middle-class housewives that are worried that we want to abduct their children are barking up the wrong tree because we wouldn't want anything to do with their whole mediocre and corrupt lifestyle. Because the charges are so bizarre, most mental health professionals distance themselves from the entire area of Satanism. But here in Denver, Colorado, the Bethesda Psychiatric Institute has become the first in the country to devote an entire department to treating the victims of ritual crime. Can we believe these stories of sacrifice? I believe we need to believe them. Uh, they sound bizarre. They, found, they sound uh, beyond the capacity of human beings. Uh, but the stories we receive are tremendously consistent. Is this an epidemic? Uh, I believe uh, involvement in Satanism is increasing. Uh, I believe it is present in many communities around our country and I believe it demands our attention. But somebody is apparently trying to discourage scrutiny. We've talked to therapists who treat ritual abuse victims, and they tell us of the threats they've received. I have direct knowledge of both death threats on a therapist and an attempt to end that therapist's life, which was unsuccessful. Here in Chicago, a group of well-known therapists from all over the country had the courage to share horror stories of threats and intimidation. Therapists have been directly threatened in ways that are quite alarming to them. The patient indicated to me that she wished to sacrifice the child with which she was pregnant. Naturally, I wasn't too enthusiastic about this. Uh, shortly after this uh, occurred, I start, started to get telephone death threats. One of the things that I would add is that we are now hearing these reports from literally hundreds of therapists in every part of the United States. Someone out there is telling us to back off. I was a follower of the Satanist Church uh, the, in Chicago here, um, and while on Walpurgis Knox, uh, I was uh, the head acolyte.
for that specific ceremony. And at the end of it, it we wound up murdering someone. And a person? Yes, ma'am. Um, it wasn't anybody that I knew, and I reported it. But once I had reported it and decided that to quit the Satanist church, I started receiving threatening phone calls. People would come up to my door who I didn't know, and all they'd do is say, go back to the church, and then they'd walk away. They'd never give me their name or address or anything. I received threatening mail. My mail was opened. My little sister was harassed coming to and from school several times. So what happened in the, in the, in the ritual where someone was, was murdered? And how were they murdered? Uh, they were stabbed seven times with, with knives because... In, the, in Chicago? Yes. It was... Um, what year? About eight years ago. Mm -hmm. So it was about 80, 81. Mm -hmm. And the ritual was a witch's Sabbath. And it, it got out of hand. And the high priest brought out these seven daggers. And Did they nailed person... him in, in the form of a cross with the seven daggers. Um... Was this it, person impaled against his or her will? Yes. Or did they want, wish to be sacrificed? No, this was against his will. Mm -hmm. um, but so how did you know you, were, you weren't going to be pulled in and, and impaled? That's, why I got, that's one of the reasons why I got out of the church. And the other reason why I got out of the church was <laughs> I, mentally I had a nervous breakdown after that. Mm -hmm. And I just mentally could not handle it. How do you explain that? My first question would be, were you a member of the Church of Satan, a card-carrying member of the Church of Satan? Yes, sir. And uh, who was the grotto leader? Do you have a name for I don't him? remember his name. You don't remember the name of a person who involved you in murder? Not anymore, no. Were you um, prosecuted? Like I said, I, I had, had a nervous breakdown, and I have partial amnesia, uh, Specifically about that night. The you only remember, thing I, you the remember only thing the I event really itself. remember about that night itself is that I walked in, I got my acolyte robes on, and the next thing I remember seeing was this guy laying on the table with seven daggers sticking out of his chest. Did you participate you, in the stabbing of the guy? I don't remember. You have made uh, several statements that don't fit with the Church of Satan. For example, <laughs> there is only one high priest, there is not a local one. We do not have any rituals. Only one high priest, is that you? That for the Church of Satan was Anton LaVey. Now, it has no rituals called a witch's Sabbath, per se. Uh, uh, well, it well, certainly does not have, have any ritual murder that. activities. And it has no title called acolyte at all. Mm -hmm. A, a person who is a first-degree member in the Church of Satan is referred to as a Satanist. And uh, there are no titles such as that at all. Furthermore, I found Are you telling him he's lying? I'm telling him he's lying. I'm saying From that he has, he has given us statements in great detail concerning events that took place that he has not named a single name, nor is there any record, uh, as far as I'm aware, from what he Reason, said, that okay, the police yes, investigated. I do remember several of the names of the people there. Did you tell them to the police? Yes, I, and I gave those names do? to the police, but I refused to... I refused to uh, name them on national television for two reasons. One, they might not like it and come after me. And that scares the hell out of me. Don't you think that they already know that you are talking about them here right now? Okay. If they may know that place? I... They if he is talking about events right now on your show and he's afraid that those people may be watching it, he would in fact place himself in greater danger by not identifying them right now than he would by allowing them to retain their anonymity and then perhaps to continue persecuting or threatening him. Can I ask you something? Um, what what happened to, to this victim, and were you ever prosecuted by the police, and did they investigate? No, I wasn't prosecuted because I was the one that went to the police. I was the only one that went to the police. The police went to the um, cemetery where we had that ritual, and they found the, the uh, altar and uh, a, lot of, a lot of the blood and uh, some of the trappings, but they never found the body or anybody else in the coven. What did you do with the body? I, I left. 
I I got out of there. When I realized that this guy on the on the altar was dead, I just you murdered a person and, and then just turned running. and walked away. And the police said, well, as long as you talk to us about it, it's okay, but we won't... Uh, I don't know if I was involved in the actual ritual itself. You told us that you killed the person yourself. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. I, no. What I said was that the, the murder happened at it, and I was there. I don't know... He doesn't remember if he actually stabbed them or not. In our investigation, we discovered that some of Satan's soldiers are also high-ranking officers in the United States military. Here at San Francisco's Presidio Army Base, for example, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino led a double life as a satanic high priest. The colonel's cult is listed in the San Francisco telephone book, and his phone answering machine boasts of his affiliation. This is the Temple of Set. The temple is the only international satanic religious institution fully recognized by the United States government. Indeed, the army does officially recognize Satanism as a legitimate religion and supplies chaplains with this guide for ministering to the satanic soldier. Yet unofficially, some charge that army bases have become sanctuaries for devil worshippers. Just last month, under a full moon, I took a midnight tour of the Presidio grounds with police investigator Ed Abanovsky. Are you saying that there was a satanic cult active right here on the army base? Yes, we believe so. There's evidence to substantiate that. They had uh, satanic rituals going on. There's an altar in there, and all of the graffiti on the wall would indicate that. Let's see if I can see it. How'd you find this place? This was a uh, fortification during World War II. During World War II, where they had uh, gun batteries. I can see a pentagram painted on the wall. I can see the words Prince of Darkness. On this wall, I see several inverted crosses and other obvious uh, satanic ritualistic paintings or symbols. Joseph, we've agreed to conceal your identity, but you are an officer in the United States Army. That's correct. And you were an officer in the United States Army during the time you were a member of this satanic organization. Yes. Did the authorities at the Presidio know that a satanic organization was active on their base during the time that you were a member? They were very much aware of it, yes. Wouldn't that the present base commander, Colonel Rafferty, says that today at least... I know of no satanic activities whatsoever in this area. Satanism may be a constitutionally protected religion, but similar to another recent case at the United States Military Academy at West Point, here charges surface connecting ritual child abuse at the Presidio Daycare Center to the devil cult. It was here, parents and others allege, that as many as 60 young children were ritualistically abused by soldiers of Satan. What actually was done to the kids? Uh, oral copulation, sodomy, uh, defecation, uh, they were urinated on. Colonel Aquino, we note, sir, for the record, that you were originally implicated in the dreadful charges of child abuse. Would you like to comment on why those charges were brought against you? Well, the entire time that uh, the so-called child molestation scandal was occurring at the Presidio, the time period when um, uh, these terrible events were supposedly taking place, I was assigned to the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., and my wife was out there living with me. But is it not a fact that a three-and-a-half-year-old girl identified you as the alleged perpetrator of molestation? No. As uh, a matter of fact, it is not the case. An accusation was made by her stepfather, who was an Army chaplain, speaking on behalf of this child. In her original interview with the FBI, she denied ever being molested. Well, I've seen the... I, I, you are... Innocent until proven guilty. You were never charged in this case. I don't want to belabor the point. I have seen, however, the affidavits for the search warrant of your home, and they indicate the child is speaking to the authorities, not her father. This was after she had been subjected to uh, therapy. LeVay studied criminology in San Francisco and worked in the San Francisco Police Department Crime Lab. He also worked as an informant for Interpol. Prior to the Church of Satan, LeVay ran a group called the Magic Circle. LeVay's most famous associate is the National Security Agency General Michael Aquino. At the time of his membership in LeVay's group, Aquino was an army specialist in intelligence and psychological warfare. In 1973, 
he became the executive officer of the 306th Psychological Operations Battalion, contemporary with his founding of the Church of Set. General Michael Aquino wrote, From PSYOP to Mind War, The Psychology of Victory. Aquino's thesis stated that enemy populations could be subdued by inflicting a state of psychological terror and feelings of imminent destruction. He discusses the use of psychotronic weapons or electromagnetic weapons that influence the mind. Capitulation could be induced without firing a shot by extremely low frequency signals piggybacked on broadcasts of radio, TV, or microwave communications in order to influence and manipulate the thoughts and feelings of the target population. During the 1960s he was prominent in the Church of Satan and a close friend of Anton LaVey until he started his own Church of Set. A police intelligence report dated July 1, 1981 reads, quote, The Church of Set is a group of hundreds of members that operates on a national level. Michael Aquino is the official head and, and rules through a council of nine who are in fact his lieutenants." Unquote. At least two members of the Council of Nine at that time were members of Army Intelligence. In the late 1980s, Aquino was accused by the San Francisco Police Department of being involved in a satanic child molestation ring. Probable victims numbered at 68, many of whom had contracted venereal disease. Twenty-two families filed $66 million in claims against the Army claiming that criminal charges against Michael Aquino were dropped due to pressure from the army. General Aquino admitted to renting the German castle where the Nazi SS were formed and reenacting the secret ceremony among fellow intelligence officers dressed in full Nazi regalia. General Aquino is now the highest ranking officer in the National Security Agency along with General Black and General Hayden. It is important to remember that General Aquino is first and foremost a military intelligence officer with over 40 years experience in counterinsurgency operations and an expert in psychological warfare. General Aquino's psychological warfare campaign has started or infiltrated cults and other closed systems as part of a concerted effort to control large numbers of people and to destabilize the centers of constitutional and legal authority both here in the United States and in other nations. This methodology is part of a concerted plan that spans several generations. The Church of Satan and the Church of Set, as well as other cults and mainstream organizations, are closed systems with their own belief systems that are insular and separate from the reality that most people take for granted. These closed systems allow large numbers of people to be manipulated into performing antisocial acts that most members of the greater society would not contemplate. Aquino first participated in MKUltra related activities in Vietnam as part of the Phoenix program in the 1960s. These ongoing MKUltra operations are functioning as a counterinsurgency and infiltration operation aimed at destabilizing the United States and other industrialized nations. Monarch is an operation that was created by the United States government to create spies for other countries. They use children for the purpose that they are easily integrated into multiple personalities because they can dissociate. Monarch is a program that is run by Michael Angelo Aquino, who was an Army Reserve Colonel at Presidio. He is also the leader of the Temple of Set. He is also, he also runs a child daycare center. He also is involved in human sacrifice. What do you think of Linda Blood's book, The New Satanist? Could you talk about Michael Aquino and his MO? Yes, absolutely. Michael Aquino is a primary mind control programmer of mine. Um, Linda Blood is... is By the um, way, he's a litigant, too. He sues everybody that ever talks about him. Including Linda Blood. Including Linda Howard. Blood. Except us. Now, he got on national television and said, yeah, I know that, Mark Phillips. He is going to be the destruction of all organized religion in this country. <laughs> well, now there's an indictment. <laughs>
It's Mike Laquino is the founder of the Occult Temple of Set that's proliferating on our military bases. He is with the Psychological Warfare Division. Was, was. Was with the Psychological Warfare Division. Um, his, some of his power is eroding thanks to the exposure that he's getting through people like Linda Blood. And it was my experience with Michael Aquino that he does not believe in the power of Satan. He does not believe in spirituality at all. That's not a part of what he does. What he does believe in is the power of trauma on the human mind and the compartmentalization of memory through high voltage stun guns. In the very places created to care for children, in nurseries and daycare centers across the nation, there are increasing reports of ritual sexual abuse. The children of McMartin are still filled with lurid stories of their awful experience there. What did they say the devil would do to you? They said that if we told that the devil would come and kill our parents, and he said that we wouldn't live to be the age nine. What were they doing to you? Molesting me. What does um, that mean? What does molesting you mean? Touching us in places we don't want. And then they would, like, threaten us, like, oh, you don't say a word else. We're going to come to your house and kill everybody except for you, and we're going to send you to the devil and everything. And they would scare us really much. Sickening. So incredibly outrageous. So incredibly unbelievable. But Zena LaVey, are these women lying? You have to understand that everything, every single thing you've um, given as examples of Satanism here are completely from a Christian standpoint. That everything you've um, put forth as being considered satanic is not considered satanic by my standard or my are definition these women of Satanism. Lying. Well, have the bodies been found? Where are they? Cheryl Horton, who joins us via satellite from Los Angeles, Cheryl Horton. Zena LaVey, a Satanist who, A, points out that this is not in keeping with Whoa. her teaching, but B, says, where is the proof? Where is the proof? Why is there no proof if what you're saying is true? Hi, Geraldo. There's no proof for, for a fact of one thing. They burn the bodies. They either do that, they'll chop them up and dump them in the ocean, or they'll pour them in concrete, or they take and they use them for communion and eat them and then make bones out of the tools. Okay. Cheryl, listen. These the stories, listen, let me, let me interrupt you. Cheryl, okay. please, let me interrupt you. The stories dump in the ocean, chop up the bodies, these things, they sound like they can't be happening. Ted Gunnerson, respected law enforcement professional, recently or retired now from the FBI, former regional director of Los Angeles. Do you, sir, believe that these dreadful allegations of babies being sacrificed are true? I absolutely believe it, without any doubt based on the information that's been given to me across the country by numerous survivors and by confidential sources and informants. Then why don't you name these people and arrest them? Never a name, never an arrest. These women come out of a group and they insist that they know the people in the group and yet they do not identify these large mysterious cults. Name them and arrest them and get them off the street. Does he not make a valid point? He makes a valid point. The problem with that is, number one, police officers don't believe it. I may believe it. You may believe it. Some people in your audience may believe it. They don't believe it. Number two, if you decide to investigate these people, you have to, number one, handle it from an undercover operation. If you put an undercover operation into effect, then you have, in a, in, in a sense, your own police officers become involved in these heinous crimes. And they are, of course, become murderers. And in addition to that, if you do, do decide to investigate these people, it's a, it's a lot of work. And many law enforcement officers are apathetic and uh, don't want to get involved. Uh, I want to make it very clear in the beginning, I'm not anti-government. I don't believe in terrorism. And I want to make it especially clear that there are a lot of good people in the FBI and the CIA Naval Intelligence, Army Intelligence, Military Intelligence, NSA. Unfortunately, there are a few key people in key positions who have made a difference, a big difference, in what's happening in America today. So, looking back, my personal experiences, I retired from the FBI March 1979 
At that time, I was in charge of the FBI Los Angeles Division. I had more than 700 personnel under my command. The Attorney General of the United States, Griffin Bell, asked me after I retired if I'd coordinate security for the Pan American Games. I did. I was a consultant in the 1984 Los Angeles Olympics. I was a consultant for former Governor Jerry Brown, California, California Narcotic Authority. So I do have credentials. My first major and credibility, believe me. Now, if you read the internet, you may not think so because there are some heavy duty FBI informants out there like Stu Webb and Barbara Hartwell who are MK Ultra mind control victims, CIA mind control victims, who are making all kinds of disparaging remarks about me. But I don't want to deal with those people because if you read their material, you'll see that it's designed to discredit people like me, former state senator John DeCamp, and other leaders who are trying our best to expose what's happening in America today and actually around the world. Let's go back to 1776, May the 1st. Adam Weishoff was commissioned by the Rothschild family to set up the goals to control and take over the world with a one world government. Adam Weishoff came up with 25 goals. Among these goals were control the press, corrupt the youth through sex and drugs, elect our own people, our own people meaning the Illuminati, to key positions in all levels of the government, city, county, state, and federal. And it goes on. The final goal was to take over the world, the one world government. Information is very well documented by William Guy Carr in his magazine, his book, excuse me, Pawns in the Game. When I retired, I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea about the Illuminati. I had no idea about Adam Weishoff. However, my first major investigation when I returned from Puerto Rico was a Dr. Jeffrey R. McDonald case. He's a former Green Beret doctor who was convicted of murdering his wife and two children at Fort Bragg, February 17, 1970. He'd been tried and convicted and sentenced to three consecutive life sentences. I was asked by the defense team to investigate the case because they claimed that Dr. McDonald was innocent. I said I would, but if I learned that he murdered his wife and two children, I would discontinue my investigation and no longer become involved. I want you to know I'm still working for Dr. McDonald. He is an innocent man. Now, once I became involved in the case, I had to read everything. And I learned that evidence was lost, evidence was stolen, evidence was altered. An FBI agent, Paul Stombaugh, lied before the grand jury. And most important of all, Colette, the wife, had skin where she had fought off the assailants under her fingernails. That skin was handed over to William F. Ivory, the chief investigator for the Army, and it has disappeared. Ten months into the case, October 25, 1980, I, through a series of circumstances, I don't have time to go into the details now, obtained a signed confession from one Helena Stokely. I had three sessions with her, ten days each, total of 30 days. Helena told me that Dr. McDonald did not commit those crimes, that they were committed by her satanic cult group. And I said to myself, what's this all about? I don't know anything about Satanism. I read about it in the Bible, of course, and that's about it. But as I delved into the case, I learned that drugs from Southeast Asia were being flown into the United States to various military bases in plastic bags 
in the bodies of the dead GIs. I further learned from Helena that her satanic cult group was involved in distributing these drugs up and down the East Coast. They were mad at Dr. McDonald because he was abusive to the cults, the cult members and the GIs who went to the civilian hospital where he was moonlighting for relief of some sort. So they went in and attacked him that night. There were a total of seven involved in the crime. She named them all for me. Right now, today, I know where some of them are located. But to further check and document this, I went to the UCLA library, and I found out, in fact, in the Time magazine, January 1, 1973, there was an article about bringing drugs in plastic bags in the body cavities of dead GIs. There was no question in my mind, Helena, was telling the truth. I gave her a polygraph test and she passed. I had her examined by a psychiatrist and she passed. And as a matter of fact, the government themselves had given her a polygraph examination early in their investigation before I entered the case. And Brizantine, the Army polygraph operator, said that she thought that she was telling the truth. She thought she was there that night. I'm telling you a little bit about the, about the McDonald case because that's what woke me up as to what was going on. It was after that that I started researching and went back and found out about the Illuminati. Illuminati slash Satanism. It was after that uh, that uh, I learned considerable more about what was going on. And the most recent information, Dr. McDonald, who's been in the penitentiary for some 25 or 26 years now, appeared before a parole board just two days ago, his first that he's ever appeared before a parole board. And the reason he had never appeared before is because, in his opinion, had he appeared before, it would be an admission of guilt. In this particular instance, he still claimed he was innocent, but he did appear before the board because he's a newly wed individual with a woman named Kathy. And of course, if you read the papers in the last two days, his parole was turned down and the parole board made him eligible for another hearing in 15 years. This poor man not only lost his wife and two children, he has served 25 years in the penitentiary and another 15 years to go. He's 61 years old. I am still working the case. What are the latest developments on the case? In 1997, the judge, federal judge, agreed to do a DNA test and they, just, they chose 15 individual pieces of evidence to be examined. However, the judge said that when you open the evidence envelopes, only the prosecutor can be present. Well, they opened the evidence envelopes. The prosecutor did. How many do you think were empty? Five. Five evidence envelopes were empty. The skin under Colette's fingernails would have established Dr. McDonald's innocence alone. Now we have DNA uh, authorized in 1997. Here we are in 2005. They still have not completed the DNA test. From the McDonald case, the next case I worked of a major consequence was the McMartin Preschool case in Manhattan Beach, California. The children there claimed there were tunnels under the school. They were taken into the tunnels and through the tunnels up into the trap door of a bathroom in the triplex next door, placed in automobiles and prostituted in the community. These are two, three, and four-year-old children before they entered kindergarten. In addition, the children claimed that they were flown into the mountains where they were involved with adults in robes, black robes, chanting candles. They talked about the brown babies who were, sacri who were cut up, actually sacrificed, and in checking into this and researching this, of course, this was obviously a satanic ceremony. 
The McMartin family who owned the preschool, they were tried of Dre Bucky and his grandmother. I had an opportunity in 1990 to gain control of the school. Now, the school had been given to Danny Davis, the defense attorney, and he had sold it, even though he made $15 million on the case, by the way. He had sold it uh, to a contractor who was going to tear it down. When I learned this, I contacted the contractor. I said, I want to be given an opportunity to go on that school and look for the tunnels. The authorities had looked for them in 1987. They said they could find no tunnels. Along with some of the parents, we hired Dr. Gary Stickle, UCLA archeologist. He hired his crew and brought them in. And in 34 days, Dr. Stickle said, there had been tunnels under that school. They were covered up and they were covered in. An informant of mine told me that there was an abandoned satanic site in Crestline, California, up in the mountains. From there, I became involved in another case, very frightening case, because I established, with the help of people like John DeCamp, former state senator in Nebraska, that we have in this country today a covert military criminal enterprise, government enterprise, primarily by U.S. military intelligence that is operating full throttle and everybody refuses to investigate it. In the Nebraska case, it's called the Franklin cover-up. This is the book here that I that Johnny Camp wrote, by the way. It's all documented in there. And in that particular instance, they were taking children out of foster homes, orphanages, um, Boys Town, driving them from Omaha, Nebraska to Sioux City, Iowa, 184 miles away, placing them in fri private jets and flying them to Washington, D.C. for sex orgies with prominent people, including congressmen, senators, and certain people in the White House. It's well documented. I have personally talked to Paul Benassi. I had a five, I have a five hour interview with him at some that I gave, that he gave me in 1993. Paul told me how he was used. He was part of the kidnapping crew and was used as a decoy and when he was 10, 11, 12 years old in parks, shopping malls to attract the children over near where the adults were in a car waiting for them. They throw them in the back seat, chloroform them and wake off with them. Paul also told me that these children, many of them become sex slaves. Many of them are used as toys. The boys, they call the boys toys. I don't know what they call the girls. But these degenerate, sick people, the men are more interested in the little boys than they are the girls for some reason. But it's all well documented. Paul drew the inside living quarters of the White House. Now this information broke in about 1987. That's about right after I entered, just before I entered the case. I replaced a fellow named Gary Caradori, who was the investigator for a Nebraska Senate committee. Gary met the official photographer of the group who had split from the group, defected, and agreed to take the pictures that this official photographer gave him, and they met in Chicago, agreed to take the pictures back to the committee. He flew out of Chicago in his private plane, short di uh, period, a short distance out of Chicago. The plane exploded midair. He and his 11-year-old boy were uh, died. His briefcase has never been found. The rear seat of the airplane has never been found. I had made every attempt possible to obtain uh, and obtain uh, possession of or control of that plane because I wanted to examine it for bomb 
chemicals, particularly the vaccine, it's no, long, it's no longer available. Nobody knows what happened to it. Gary Caridari was a civilian, yet it was taken to a military base uh, for examination. A deputy sheriff was the first one on the scene. He saw the pictures. He started picking up the pictures. An FBI agent came along, took the pictures away from him, told him to keep his mouth shut. Uh, he started talking to a few people. A, month, a year later, his wife was murdered. He's no longer talking. This international child kidnapping ring, I later learned, was out of Washington, D.C. It was very active, and the organization is known as the Finders. And I have a report on the Finders back there. Everything I'm telling you is documented, by the way. The Finders has been established and operating throughout the 1960s up to the present time. It was exposed in 1987. They moved their operation to Wichita, Kansas, and they're operating right today in Wichita, Kansas. I have taken my report to the FBI a half a dozen times, demanded an investigation, and I have yet to be interviewed. So we have the finders, we have the Franklin cover-up, which documents what I'm telling you, we have the pawns in the game, pawns in the game is the Illuminati, this is the Illuminati slash satanic movement in this country today. And the last thing I'm going to mention in the way of a book is why Johnny can't come home. Johnny Gosh was... September the 5th, 1982, a newspaper boy on a Sunday, and he was about to deliver his newspapers in West Des Moines, Iowa. He never delivered any newspapers. He disappeared. The mother, Noreen Gosh, demanded an investigation of the FBI and by the West Des Moines Police Department. The chief of police in West Des Moines said to her, even though he's disappeared, we do not have any witnesses who saw him being grabbed and placed in a car or being taken control of. So we're not going to investigate it. The FBI used the same premise. They refused to investigate it. Now, I've been involved in kidnappings in the FBI. And I can tell you that it's automatic within 24 hours, at the end of 24 hours, that we had to go in, in my day, this was back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Today, as we, as I stand here and you sit there, the children are disappearing in this country at the rate of 83 per hour. That's over 700,000 children a year. Now, I can go back to July 1982. The Reader's Digest claimed there were 100,000 children disappearing every year. There's another statistic that I find very interesting, and that is that it is estimated 2,500 children are kidnapped and murdered in this country every year. That's an unbelievable figure. Yet, the FBI refuses to investigate it. Now, after the Nebraska case, and part of the Nebraska case, most recently, we have a young man named Jeff Gannon, who has appeared in the White House using a fraudulent press pass. This has happened within the last month. The uh, certain people in the White House were questioning him and were suspicious of him because when he would engage in a press conference with the president, President Bush, he was asking what they call soft questions. Soft questions meaning the president would have an answer for them, he'd look good. Somebody started checking into his background. They learned that he was actually an individual named Jim Guckert. This is all on the internet, by the way. 
and Guckert had a homosexual website. So Jeff Gannon is an alias of Jim Gucker. Now his picture appeared in the internet and he is believed to be Johnny Gosh who was kidnapped September the 5th, 1982. The mother, Noreen Gosh, who wrote this book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, I have a two-hour interview with her. She did not sit still for this. Can you imagine if the 83 mothers of children who disappear every hour would do what Noreen Gosh has done? We wouldn't have this problem today. She went to the FBI, demanded an investigation. They refused to investigate. The police refused to investigate because the case tied into the Franklin cover-up. Some of our top politicians in the country, leading businessmen. Harold Anderson was identified by the children. The head of the Nebraska Forestry Service was identified by these children. There are 80 children came forward in this Nebraska case. And it goes, as I said, right up to the White House. Hiermit werden wir uns auch noch einmal befassen. Und das hier wird der Gegenstand des nächsten Teils der okkulten Elite sein. Das Franklin Cover-Up ist nur eines von vielen Beispielen dafür, in welchen gesellschaftlichen Kreisen sich diese Kriminalität abspielt. Abschließend möchte ich noch sagen, dass ich die folgende Einschätzung von Mark Passi aufgrund meiner bisherigen Erfahrungen für mehr als wahrscheinlich halte. Bis zum nächsten Mal. Uh, as my involvement with Satanism in general, not just the Church of Satan organization grew, I became aware that this wasn't an isolated group of individuals that were just working with occulted or hidden knowledge in order to uh, essentially grow their own personal power, but they were groups, uh, inter-networked groups of, of people who were working together. Uh, and they, were, they came from an, a, a, an eclectic array of, uh, of people from every walk of life, every social institution that you could imagine, there were Satanists placed in positions of high power and influence within those institutions, including politics, banking, law, military, law enforcement, entertainment, technology, medicine, education, and every other area of our lives. And they were not isolated individuals that were just trying to increase their own personal power and influence. They were working together as a tight-knit unit toward a common goal, and that common goal was to increase their own collective power at the expense of everyone else's rights and freedoms. I consider the groups I was involved in very low level, certainly not high level by any stretch of the imagination. I do consider that LaVey was sort of a puppet for these higher level satanic networks and groups and certainly worked with governmental institutions during the time that he was alive. I heard that and I won't mention his name, but it was a big leader and founder of a, a huge satanic organization. And um, he was on his deathbed. And for a Satanist, at the time of death, it's a great victory for them because death is a, is a, is a huge thing that they celebrate. And he was getting ready to die and pass on his powers and that. And on his deathbed, he must have got some revelation or an angelic um, appearance or something. And he went into shock and he said, oh my. Oh I my, done? what have I done? He said, there's something very wrong. There's something very wrong. There's something very wrong. Wow. And his whole life had been spent propagating these satanic beliefs, getting everyone to believe, establishing official organizations for Satanism. And then at the end of his life, he gets this, right. this, wow. this light that comes to him. And everything that he built, he realized was wrong and founder of a, a huge satanic organization. It wasn't actually that I was interested in Satanism. It was that I was interested in witchcraft. And I always had been, and I happened to read an advertisement for Witches Charm School with lectures by Anton LeVay. 